to have you with us on this Monday edition of Ed Schultz News and Commentary. Lots of news over the weekend. I hope you had a great one. I was in Las Vegas last week uh, doing some groundwork for the ASMC. That is our super PAC, Americans for a Strong Middle Class. We're going to get in this game, of course, with a tremendous focus on jobs, health care, education, trade, and justice. And when it comes to foreign policy, I know that there is a lot of folks in this country who are somewhat disappointed that we have been boxed into a policy in Afghanistan that we simply cannot get out. The schedule the United States has had to prepare that country to run its own government certainly hasn't worked. When has it worked? It hasn't worked for thousands of years. We are now living the nightmare that what the Soviet Union lived back in the 80s and 90s. Once they got into Afghanistan, they couldn't get out. And so the president making the announcement last week that we are going to leave troops in there until 2017, it's going to come to a pretty solid cost, but it's a policy that just seems to be never ending. Can we ever get out of Afghanistan? The Democratic candidates seeking the nomination, both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, seem to be somewhat sympathetic to the position the president is taking. This is Bernie Sanders, who you would think, say, we're going to get the hell out of there. He says this. Well, yeah, I mean, I won't give you the exact number. Uh, clearly what the president has been trying to do, and I say this as somebody who voted against the war in Iraq, uh, a war which destabilized the entire region, uh, clearly we do not want to see the Taliban gain more power, and I think we need a certain nucleus of American troops present in Afghanistan to try to provide the training and support the Afghan army needs. Is that the realistic position? Here's Hillary Clinton. She too is saying she doesn't know what she's going to do on Afghanistan and she doesn't know what it's going to be like in January of 2017. What you're seeing with President Obama is a perfect example of a leader who has strong convictions about what he would like to see happen but also pays attention to what's going on in uh, the real world and his decision is one that I agree with. I will not sit here today and say what I would do upon taking office because again we want to bring our troops home. We certainly don't want them engaged in on-the-ground combat. We want them to help support and train uh, the Afghan uh, army and we want them to you know continue to work with the uh, government uh, of Afghanistan to try to help strengthen uh, security for them. Uh, so All right, let's, br let, let's break this down. Here's the bottom line. The American people want to stay safe. We don't want to get hit again. Is it important for us to have a substantial military presence in Afghanistan to make sure that this country does not get hit? We always hear about we're going to give them support and we're going to give them military training. We've, hear, we've heard that in just about every country in the Middle East. What about Afghanistan? This seems to be a never-ending nightmare. Let's turn to Admiral Joe Sestek, who's running for the United States Senate in Pennsylvania. Admiral, good to have you with us. Good to be with you, Ed. Thanks. Your call on this. This is a tough call. This is one, uh, as you see it, how? It's a necessary call, but not for the reasons that we just heard. I'm supporting this because of something else, ISIS, that has appeared in Afghanistan. Just like it took over large portions of Iraq and is causing the real damage within Syria against our interest. This is not a terrorist group. We have to change how we look at ISIS that's embarking upon going into Afghanistan. It is simply an ambitious, revisionist, and very dangerous wannabe aspiring state. This is different. Iran does not want ISIS in Afghanistan as a state where it establishes institutions. It actually establishes its own laws. It has its own banking facility. This is different. And that's mm. why the president has done what he did in Iraq. It's why we are trying and probably will end up cooperating with Russia there in Syria. It's becoming a balance of power, a different type of an approach. And right now, to totally walk away from Afghanistan, which a year ago I would have said yes, because it's not about the Taliban, because we didn't go in there for the Taliban. It was about al-Qaeda. And we can handle al-Qaeda without being in Afghanistan. Ed, this is about ISIS which is an aspiring state wannabe. Okay, so clearly the circumstances have dramatically changed since the first day we went into Afghanistan. 
the mission and focus has changed, and now we've caught ourselves in a position where we just can't leave, as you see it. We have to get out of there, but it has to be with assurance that ISIS has been wrecked as a state, a wannabe state, first in Iraq, holding them back in Afghanistan, but this cannot be unending. I've been on your show that says this has got to end because our national security interests elsewhere are important. But we went into that tragic misadventure of Iraq, and we broke it, and the splinters have arrived in a form of an aspiring uh, state that wants to dominate. This is different, and it's a shame that we did not take down ISIS immediately as they moved into Iraq, and it's also a shame that we went into Iraq that caused this to occur. But that said, right now, ain't the Taliban. Isn't about al-Qaeda. It's about ISIS. Admiral Joe Sestak with us, running for... United States Senate in Pennsylvania, giving support to the president here in Ed Schultz, Susan commentary that this was the right call. All right. So what is a defeat of ISIS? What does it look like? What would we do with 5,500 troops in there that would uh, reject this state and reverse the circumstances? There's only one important element that must be done, and that is to ensure that the Afghanistan troops, as you said, which we have tried to do in other places, often unsuccessfully, are able to hold back ISIS. This, again, is not about Taliban. I emphasize that this is about ISIS. And so that is what has to be done. And that's why, to some extent, also having the special forces there is helpful, because even though I don't look at ISIS as a terrorist, it is larger threat to us than that, they are very helpful in surgical strikes against it. So you have two elements here, but I think the president needs to lay out that the real threat to us isn't Taliban, who was there for a decade or so before Mm -hmm. we went in. And now that has been controlled, it's ISIS. The political theater is out and about. This is Ted Cruz on the Sunday shows saying that this is just a failed policy by Obama. Well, listen, it's a recognition that, that, that what the president has been saying for years, that al-Qaeda is decimated, was never true. That it was political spin. The reality is we live in an incredibly dangerous world, and sadly, the failures of the Obama-Clinton foreign policy have made the de- dangers if you become president, though, you're going to keep his, this policy in place of keeping those troops there in Afghanistan? It will depend on the mission. I don't believe we should be engaged in nation building. I don't believe we should be trying to transform foreign countries into democratic utopias, trying okay. to turn Iraq into Switzerland. A- Admiral, does, does Ted Cruz know what he's talking about? The only thing in what he said had some legitimacy is it is a dangerous world. Yeah. But then you see... Besides criticizing, he won't even take a position. It depends. Yeah, That's the failure of someone like him. And almost, I would say, senators in the Senate, they don't understand the use of the military in the proper way. And they aren't had courageous enough to speak about it. So ISIS is a residual of our in- international intervention in Iraq. And now we have got strange political bedfellows finally figuring yeah. out what ISIS is all about. The dynamic yeah. has changed, and now it seems like we have to uh, re-educate the American people on, on why we're in Afghanistan. And uh, you're very but, well put. Okay. There's going to be a lot of Americans that aren't going to buy it. Um, why not just get out? What, what would happen if we said, okay, we're going to do what Obama wanted to do when he was elected and reelected, and that's end operations in Afghanistan? What if we do that? What interest does ISIS have in Afghanistan, of all places? ISIS has the ability, when it had $400 million as it occupied Iraq, some of which has been, you know, uh, brought down, to actually establish a rule of law, a country, a state that it can dominate and have as its own country. And from there, it has talked about what it wants to do mm-hmm. in growing this Islamic state of it. We've watched it in Syria, in Iraq, and the danger to us and to our allies and friends is enormous. This is not a cult. This is not a terrorist group. Mm-hmm. It is a It is a dangerous, aspiring wannabe state. And this is why Russia, Iran, Assad, uh, people like that, 
Saudi Arabia become our strange bedfellows in it. This is a balance of power approach. And so, therefore, for us to treat it as a terrorist threat, we will have the wrong strategy, and we will stay in Afghanistan far too long. We all right. have to work with Iran and others on this threat. Well, the others are the Russians, and we all know how cool it is between Putin and the United States. Uh, so how do you remedy that? How do you get the Russians with the United States to realize that it's in their best interest and ours that we knock back ISIS? This is where America should be and has at times, like with the Iranian Accord, been at its best. It is hard-nosed diplomacy. This is where we have worked with Russia to begin to deconflict the airspace. But now it's working with them to make sure it's ISIS we go against. And sometimes we're going to have to buy things we don't like, like Assad remaining longer in power than we would like. But this threat has changed the dynamic, that threat being ISIS. This is where, like in days of old, our, if it's an enemy of us and one of our other enemies, we two enemies are working together about it. I'll never forget talking to the uh, military commander as I was a congressman of Afghanistan. And I said, do we have any common interest with Iran in Afghanistan? He said, we do. They don't want instability there, and they don't want al-Qaeda there. There are ways we could work with them. Well, you know what? We may be able to work with them with ISIS, and we may be able to work with them uh, to take out ISIS, not just in Afghanistan, but Iraq, uh, at Syria. This is a mm. balance of power approach, and we better get our strategy right, or we will just treat it as a terrorist threat and stay there far too long. Admiral Joe Sestak, great friend and resource to Ed Schultz News and Commentary. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time, Joe. Thanks for having me, Ed. You bet. This is Ed Schultz News and Commentary, brought to you by Communication Workers of America, Alliance for American Manufacturing, BioGreen Clean, and the iSave team. When we come back, the middle class in America is struggling. The numbers are out again. David K. Johnson is with us. Also, the flap between the Bushes and the Trumps when it comes to keeping the country safe. Stay with us. Hey folks, you've heard me talk about BioGreen Clean. I'm going to show you right now on my airplane just how tough this is. I want you to keep in mind, chemical free, 100% plant derived, biodegradable. It is the safest cleaner that you can get and it's the most effective. Go to our website, wegotahead.com or go to biogreenclean.com www.biogreenclean.com and order today. It's time to continue our conversation about mechanical insulation. Mechanical insulation is for the piping systems in our nation's commercial and industrial facilities. Facility owners are burning up billions of dollars through the lack of mechanical insulation on these piping systems. Call the iSave team. Insulation saves America valuable energy, and this team of energy conservation specialists is shovel-ready to save you money. Visit iSaveTeam.org to have a specialist give your plant an energy audit. We perpetuate a culture of crime all the way from Wall Street right down to the Main Street in our hometowns. It's worse than it has been since FDR took control of the problem and said we can't count on industry taking care of the American labor. They probably have already engaged in some type of criminal cover-up. And the law prohibits the government from even doing anything about it. Catch America's lawyer Mike Papantonio on YouTube at youtube.com slash goleftv. Good to have you back with us here on this Monday edition of Ed Schultz News and Commentary. Many of you know that I have started a, a super PAC. I am the president of ASMC, Americans for Strong Middle Class. I think it's long overdue. We're going to get into some heated issues about the middle class in this country. Our focus of the super PAC is going to be jobs, health care, education, trade, and justice. There's a lot of work to be done, no question about it. But I want to focus now on exactly the numbers that are coming out that shows that wage earners in this country clearly are falling behind as time moves on. And if you remember back, I used to show the vulture chart all the time about where middle class wages and low income wages have been over the last 40 years to compare to the top 2% and 1% in this country. Clearly, we are facing a concentration of wealth in America. This, of course, is central to the campaign of Bernie Sanders and the Democratic platform, for that matter, about addressing the middle class in this country. It is the focal point of conversation in every interview that's taking place. 
Let's go to David K. Johnson, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, contributing uh, editor with Newsweek. David K., good to have you with us. Glad to be here. The numbers that you point out clearly show that we are in the crisis mode when it comes to disposable income in this country. What did you find out based on the numbers of the Social Security Administration? Well, they show that the top quarter of workers, that is workers who make $50,000 a year or more, are pulling away from everybody else. And we had a big surge in a very tiny number of workers, but it's very revealing. People who make over $50 million a year. Uh, the number of those folks went up from 110 to 134. And all of the data show, when you break it down very clearly, that we are not creating enough jobs. We're about 4 million jobs behind where we would be if we'd had a normal recovery and a normal congressional response to the Great Recession. But overall, the uh, higher wage workers are getting all the gain. So the bottom line here is that we've had 67 months of private sector job growth, but we're still behind in the pace of a full recovery because of the job numbers, correct? A absolutely. And uh, uh, I mean, the one in one way good sign, Ed, is people who work part time and make under fifteen thousand uh, dollars, their incomes dipped their numbers, the number of them dipped somewhat, that would be a good sign if the next group up uh, made more money because it would suggest people are moving up the income ladder and that's not what the data shows. It's and the fact is, is that, and the fact is that we're just not keeping pace with even mild inflation. Well, no, we're this, no, we, we are under Obama getting slightly ahead of inflation finally, but the median wage, half make more, half make less, is still stuck in 2014 at the same level of 1999. It's, it's varied within just a few dollars since 1999. And that should be very troubling to us because that's the, the best measurement of what's typical is the median wage, half make more, half make less. To go six, 15 years, 1999 through 2014, without it budging, Ed, that's a very troubling sign that uh, we're not doing well for workers. Okay, so the root of the problem is this. Is this connected or paralleled to the attack on labor in this country? Oh, I think absolutely. Uh, one of the most important factors is, and I say this to conservatives all the time, if you believe in market economics, then you must believe in unions because individual workers, with rare exceptions, do not have any bargaining power. They are ultimately mostly commodities. And unions provide workers with the power to negotiate. Now, that doesn't mean unions are perfect, but of course, why is it we expect unions to be perfect but not companies? So did the health care law, the Affordable Care Act, change any of these numbers whatsoever to take the strain off of families that were facing a financial ruin because they had no protection? Well, the, the numbers themselves here are not going to show that, but I think yeah. it's very clear that the Affordable Care Act, especially in terms of people with pre-existing conditions, which is essentially everybody in America over the age of 40, uh, are, are much better off because of it. It's not, of course, the most efficient, best system that would benefit workers and small business owners, which is universal health care with no out-of-pocket costs. It would okay. save us a lot of money. All right. So what is doing well in this economy is corporate profits. Oh, and, it's, yes. and it's the wealthy Americans who are investing in the stock market that are riding the tide of the corporate profits. That's where their income is coming from. It's coming from the financial sector. It's coming from the paper shuffling that's taking place on Wall Street. It's not, as some people would call, true earned income or your analysis of that. Right. Well, uh, there's almost no place for this surplus money at the top to go but into the stock market, so it is pushing the market up. I'm not sure how stable that is, Ed. I think there's some con we should have some concern about that. But the uh, it is people at the top who have more and more income with which they have no place to invest and which is way beyond any human being's capacity to spend who are driving the stock market up along with these automatic systems like 401k systems that millions of workers are in. Yeah. One of the things that we're going to be focusing on with our super PAC, ASMC, Americans for a Strong Middle Class, is this onslaught on all of these state houses where right-to-work legislation has been introduced. 
It's very clear where there's right to work states, the wages are depressed. The upward mobility for wage earners in this country certainly are harnessed quite a bit. And that's just one of the things we're going to be focusing on. David K. Johnson, always a great resource. Good to have you with us on Ed Schultz, Susan Commentary. Thank you, Aaron. When we come back, commentary, Bush versus Trump, Bush versus Rubio in history revisionism taking place in the middle of this 2016 campaign. We're back after this. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, President of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. The Ed Schultz Internet Broadcast is brought to you by the Ring of Fire Radio Show. Listen to the Ring of Fire weekends on radio stations across the country. Get more information and the news of the day at ringoffireradio.com. Communication Workers of America Alliance for American Manufacturing, BioGreen Clean, and the ISAFT bring you this production Monday through Friday. Good to have you with us on this Monday edition of Ed Schultz News and Commentary. The questions still linger about who won the debate or who had the advantage coming out of the Democratic debate last week in Las Vegas. Well, a CNN ORC poll shows that Hillary Clinton is at 45 percent, but Bernie Sanders goes up five. He's now at 29 percent. Biden, who wasn't even in the debate, is at 18 percent. And everybody else, uh, I don't even think their name's worth mentioning, but we will. Jim Webb, Lincoln Chafee, and Martin O'Malley, they're all at less than one percent. They shouldn't even be in the next debates. I mean, the country turned in to see two people, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, go at it. And that's where the rest of the debates should be, because none of the others have made any kind of substantial movement whatsoever. And all they do is interrupt, especially Jim Webb. All right. On the Republican side, still trying to come to grips with the fact that Donald Trump can't get knocked off his lead horse is the establishment Republicans. And Jeb Bush is making the horrible mistake of constantly reliving and trying to rebuild the reputation of his brother. Now, the fact of the matter is we were hit on September 11th, 2001. And on August 6th, the presidential daily briefing, August 6th, 2001, the Bush administration was warned by counterintelligence agents that terrorists wanted to hijack commercial airlines and fly them into buildings in the United States. We didn't shut down any airports. We didn't add any security. We didn't do any surveillance. We didn't do anything. We just waited for it to happen. In fact, I was in Washington on September 11, 2001. I was outside Capitol Police headquarters. The first U.S. senator I talked to was Richard Shelby from Alabama. I put a microphone in front of him right after the attack. I said, Senator, what do you know? And he said to me, we knew we were going to get hit. We just didn't know when. My jaw dropped. He says, we're going to hunt them down like dogs because that's what they are. Well, it took a long time to do that. And finally, it was Obama who got bin Laden. The fact of the matter is, is that if this country knew it was going to get hit, why didn't we protect the country? Now, if Jeb Bush on his campaign wants to get involved in conversation like that, have at it. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's one candidate out there and it's Donald Trump. And he's sick and tired of hearing about how the Bushes are doing history revisionism and reminding us that George W. Bush kept us safe. Well, what is any president supposed to do? The fact is we were hit on their watch. Here's Trump responding to it. I think I'm much more competent than all of them when you talk about George Bush. I mean, say what you want. The World Trade Center came down during his time. Uh, if you look Hold at on, Sandy that, Hook, you can't blame George Bush well, for that. Really, he was president, okay? Don't blame him or don't blame him, but he was president. The World Trade Center came down during his reign. I think you can blame Bush. Absolutely. The question is, why didn't he respond to his own intelligence community when he was told on August 6, 2001, 
that terrorists wanted to hijack commercial airlines and fly them into buildings. And then that's exactly what happened a month later. So who, who shoulders the blame for any of this? The counterintelligence people, the intelligence community for not telling the administration? No, the administration was told. So here comes Jeb Bush trying to mop up his brother's reputation. And this is not a winning strategy in a campaign. Here it is. Look, my brother uh, responded to a crisis and he did it uh, as you would hope a president would do. He united the country, he organized our country, and he kept us safe. And there's no denying that. The great majority of Americans believe that. And uh, I don't know why he keeps bringing this up. It's uh, It doesn't show that he's a serious person as it relates to being commander in chief and being uh, the architect of a foreign policy. Across the spectrum of foreign policy, Mr. Trump talks about things that uh, as though he's still on the apprentice. I mean, literally talking about Syria, saying ISIS should take out Assad, then Russia should take out ISIS as though it was some kind of board game. Well, it's not a board game. And the fact is, is that Trump is now saying that if he is president, his immigration policy would have prevented what happened to this country. I am extremely, extremely tough on illegal immigration. I'm extremely tough on people coming into this country. I believe that if I were running things, I doubt those families would have, I doubt that those people would have been in the country. So there is a good chance that those people would not have been in our country. With that being said, I'm not blaming George Bush, but I don't want Jeb Bush to say, my brother kept us safe because September 11th was one of the worst days in the history of this country. I think that that plays to fair-minded Americans. I do. I think that the American people recognize that mistakes were made in our intelligence community and by the administration for not keeping us safe. And if you want to count the Bush administration starting on September 12th to the end of the time of when he got out, yeah. And look how many trillions of dollars we put into protecting this country. The fact is, this is an argument that Jeb Bush is never going to win. This is certainly uh, an opportunity for Donald Trump to not only talk about the country being hit, but what he would have done to prevent it. And he connected it to immigration. The guy's got phenomenal media moxie. He knows what to do and how to do it. And I think he plays to the common sense of a lot of Americans. This is Ed Schultz News and Commentary. These polls aren't going to change anytime soon as Trump knows how to play these jokers. We're back tomorrow.